European Scientific Publications, and it's regularly involved as a reviewer and also serving different organizational roles in top conferences like the DataDAP, DMDB, EDPT, ISWC. So for all these reasons, thank you very much, Katia, for joining us. It's been quite a long time that I've been inviting you to Barcelona. Finally, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, thank you very much for accepting me. Thanks a lot for the uh, nice introduction. Um, so, yeah, let's just get started with the talk. So, so it's about no intelligence without knowledge. So let's see what I mean. First, I prepared a bit of a self-introduction that seems a bit so, uh, not necessary now, but never mind. <laughs> so um, that is me, kind of. And I graduated from um, to Illumina a while ago. Uh, where I started to work on peer to peer systems actually, um, on a distributed career processing and peer to peer systems basically. Then I moved on as a postdoc to Max Planck, where I started to work on semantic web topics. So, knowledge graphs, linked data on the web, uh, but still kind of uh, career processing uh, on, or distributed career processing. So, a different kind of distribution and different kind of query language and data, but still. Um, and then I joined uh, Auburn University uh, as a professor, and then I broadened the scope of it to general graph databases, uh, query optimization problems, and uh, also um, the things you need to get to a knowledge graph. So first you need to do a bit of uh, extraction to get the knowledge graph, you need to watch the quality of the, uh, of the data you get. You still need to do a lot of data management and query optimization. In the end, you also do some machine learning or other applications to use the data collected. So the scope broadened a bit. And since uh, March this year, I'm at uh, to be in, in Austria. So there's a particular reason I've introduced myself like that. So some of you might recognize what this structure is. So it's knowledge graph. So each of these edges, let's see if it works. No, uh, but these are, each of these edges is uh, expressing one fact. So, for instance, that I'm a professor at TUB. So, it's one act, uh, one edge, a directed uh, edge in a graph. It has a starting point as a node, and an end point as a node, and an edge between it with all with labels, so that you can identify the entities involved, so the nodes. And you have the label for the uh, edge in between uh, that tells you what this connection actually means. And for the mathematicians, so a knowledge graph is nothing else as a directed label graph. That's basically it. So you have labels for all the nodes and edges and big structures uh, to work with. The beauty about knowledge graphs is uh, that it's fairly easy to integrate very diverse types of data. So here's an example. So uh, the Chinese in one year, uh, one year will recognize what this is all about. Um, but uh, all you need to integrate two very diverse sets of knowledge is one, one edge. So in relations, you usually have to think, here's one nice relation, there's another relation, and what kind of relationships hold for the majority of the um, rows in one, uh, one table <coughs> and the other. Here, all I need is one single edge. I don't care about um, whether it applies to all people, or all persons, or all professors. I just care about this one instance and make a connection. So yes, I, I do like Star Trek, and I'm happy to have a chat in, in the break. Um, but as simple as that, you can connect to a totally uh, different set of knowledge that has nothing to do with my professional life, usually. Um, so And of course, each of these nodes can be connected in, in a similar way to other things. And this way, you can. Uh, create gigantic, uh, let's say, knowledge graphs uh, by combining different pieces. Okay. So, um, okay, let's have a look at the uh, knowledge graphs and the applications. Um, some go without, some go with, and some go for AI. Um, one of the classic examples when you use knowledge graphs is <coughs> Google search. So, we have this nice info box here. Information that is extracted from there and displayed is a knowledge graph. So what Google does is it recognizes that I was looking for Joe Biden. It recognizes it's an entity, 
looks up in a knowledge graph where is the node corresponding to Joe Biden, finds it, and then connects or finds all the nice information attached to it, and then displays it in this nice info box. And to be fair, um, so actually the term knowledge graph was coined by Google. Before there were lots of different names, like you would call it a uh, knowledge base or, or linked data or simply RDF. Or, uh, so there were different names, but the, the real name knowledge graph just came up when Google launched their knowledge graph. And to be fair, Microsoft is doing the same thing and, and others as well. Um, I don't know which search engine you prefer, but basically, the popular ones are all powered by this technology. And sometimes they have problems with uh, data. So that was an example from 2021 where there were German elections and there was a new chancellor. And on that day, uh, I think the um, decision was made, the change happened. But you see that one of these uh, big companies has updated their knowledge graph, the other one had not. So the underlying issue is that you have a knowledge graph, and in most applications you assume that it's, it's static, it doesn't change ever. But obviously that's not true. So sometimes, or regularly, you need to update your knowledge graph. And that's uh, down the pipeline, that's actually an issue, how to manage that efficiently. Because normally you don't want to throw away all the old data either. So you want to have the old state and the new one, and then how, what is the best way to manage it over time. And uh, of course, uh, you also need to make sure that the updates are reliable and correct. So just having somebody edit the knowledge graph and enter uh, random information is probably also not a goal we want. So it also needs to be stable. So lots of issues in updating knowledge graphs and keeping them, um, well, reflecting reality. What else do we have? Um, so basically, all the big companies uh, use knowledge graphs. And there's this nice quote here that uh, says that knowledge graphs provide the structured data and factual knowledge that drive many products and make them more intelligent and magical. Uh, but it's just an expression to show that uh, with knowledge graphs and having nice structured pieces of knowledge that you can refer to, you can uh, power a lot of different uh, applications. And it's not just um, the search engines that, that, are, that are using knowledge graphs. It's also, I see here, Facebook. I mean, naturally, they have a graph behind it, social networks, LinkedIn, eBay, IBM is also uh, providing a lot of technology to enable other companies to use knowledge graphs. And the sizes are just huge uh, normally. So this is just a small selection of uh, large companies that we know use these knowledge graphs. There's plenty of more, but these are usually the obvious cases that everybody uh, kind of knows about easily. It's not like a, a, um, small companies who run around and boast usually. But uh, from these big ones, they usually get, uh, they also do research, so we know that they're using knowledge graphs for diverse goals. Um, Open knowledge graphs, it's also an interesting application. That's, uh, it just says that it's the, the data is openly available. So everybody can use it. And that's a nice data set for researchers to play around with because you don't have to pay to use them. And researchers often create them as well. So Wikidata is a community project where people or researchers have a large <coughs> amount of data to share. Um, Yahoo and Wikipedia are both uh, extracting data from, from uh, uh, Wikipedia. So taking the Wikipedia text and putting it into structured knowledge. Um, linked life data, so that's the, uh, I think, underestimated ones because medicine, bio bioscience, they have started using knowledge graphs um, in applications. And those sizes of those data sets are just huge. So, 6.7 uh, or 7 billion facts is just enormous. And uh, no one we thought that the 2 billion uh, facts from Wikidata are big. I can be even bigger. And this bioscience data sets, it's kind of, um, it, there's a gene ontology and uh, protein interaction. So for all these different genes and proteins to try to capture what is it they do, um, how do they interact, 
and whether they occur and so on. And there's, I mean, the human genome is huge, and there's a lot of different species in there. So that explains why there's so extremely many of these guys. And of course, I forgot to mention chemistry. They're also um, using large graphs to show information about all the different molecules and substances uh, and the research data around them. So a lot of uh, different types of data. And 130 billion facts is even bigger. <coughs> so we also run into scalability problems. This is more like the classic point of view from a semantic web perspective. That's the linked open data cloud. So you have uh, each of these bubbles. That's not a node, that's an entire knowledge graph hiding in each of these bubbles. And then the idea is that you have a knowledge graph and you want to share it with, with others. And then you will create links to other knowledge graphs from other people. And as I showed before, you just create a link from one entity to another. It's just that the information about that entity is on another server. And that way you use HTTP identifiers for the nodes, and then you can directly link them on the web without really um, well, doing much more. And when you need them, you can just query them uh, spontaneously. Has some ups and downs because you need to, the other side needs to be available when you want it to be uh, to query it. It's a whole different dimension of problems. But in principle, so each of these uh, bubbles there is one knowledge graph connecting to others, which make it uh, makes it a really huge knowledge graph to begin with. And this is the so-called uh, linked uh, open data cloud that uh, is mainly um, driven by public institutions and researchers. And we have 400 billion triples in size. So quite a lot if you take everything together. Um, this is a very nice application that is more re uh, recent. So you might know Sir Tim Berners Lee. So uh, the guy who invented the web also. Um, so he's, uh, he has a new project. And that is about um, taking back control of our data. That's a nice. Um, uh, headline. But the idea is that uh, so far, um, Google, Microsoft, and the big companies, Facebook, own our data. So they collect information about us and they own it. And uh, the idea here is to turn it back and uh, have people control the data and just allow companies to access and use it. And the most intuitive use case that actually um, they are have some pilot projects on uh, is healthcare. I think there's a project in, in Belgium and UK. And the idea is that, uh, I mean, normally uh, people should own their own healthcare data. And then they control who's about to access it and who they want to share it with. Um, and when they go to a different doctor, they can revoke access to, uh, from the old one and just grab the new doctor access. And uh, this is powered by linked data to or RDF knowledge graphs to store and structure information about the people. And then we can use knowledge graphs for data integration. So if you think about classic um, data integration problems, data lakes, data fabrics. So you have uh, relational data, you have you know, tabular data, images, uh, different kinds of data, and you want to integrate them somehow. So one way is to use an intermediate layer as a knowledge graph. And just to say we have this uh, virtual integration layer as a knowledge graph, and we have entities there. And I know that if I want to use the data, uh, I know that in, uh, on this side, there's information about uh, the patient's um, um, yeah, personal data. Here's information about the uh, patient's uh, radiology images and so on. So you actually have this entity and know where to find the individual pieces of data that you might need at the moment. So it can also then be used not as a native um, data format, but also to integrate other data. <coughs> and then uh, even more recently, uh, so you might have heard about neurosymbolic AI. So let me try to, to explain the basics. Um, so it's about uh, with knowledge graphs, you can do um, logical reasoning. So you have some facts, so you can derive new facts. 
And with machine learning, we have the trained model is somewhat like a black box. We knew it will say yes, no, or maybe predict something. Um, but it can't do the logical reasoning part that you can do with uh, facts natively. Let me show an example. So we can, for instance, have this very simple hierarchy here. So we have men and women. Both are subclasses of person, which intuitively seems true. Then we have two instances of uh, um, man and woman, so that's uh, Suhav and Katya, uh, as instances of these classes. And then we can derive, for instance, knowing that Katya is a woman, and woman, uh, knowing that women are a subclass of person, we can conclude that Katya is probably a person as well. Although it's not stated anywhere directly. So these kind of logical reasoning we can do. Um, based on these facts. On the other hand, uh, we might have um, some classifiers, trained models that can classify images or text. So what they can do is say that uh, on this picture there is uh, two persons. One is probably female, the other one is probably male. They can predict that. And then you have this uh, text underneath that says uh, PC chose opening EDBT 2023. And it can probably detect that PC chairs is kind of a role, and EDBT uh, is a conference. This is what uh, and a bit of NLP and classifiers can do. So if we take these two things together, so I've added the left part a bit more information to make it more interesting. So I've also added a bit about the conference. So on the left side, we know that EDBT has two PC chairs. And these are Katja and Suhav. Katja is a woman, Suhav is a man. Men and women are persons. That's what we have encoded on the left. That's just logical uh, facts. <coughs> and on the right, we have that the PC chairs of EVT are likely on the picture. It's, it's machine learning, you can never be certain. Uh, one is likely a male person, and the other one is likely female. So, what can I do with this information? If I ask you, so who is uh, on the picture on the right? What do we say? Based on these bits and pieces of information. Do we get a moment here? <laughs> okay, maybe not. The point, with, with a bit of human uh, reasoning and a bit of logic, you will probably see that uh, it's most likely Katya and Sue on that picture. But it's not stated anywhere. So what, what the human brain intuitively does is, you look on the left, there's a set of facts, on the right there's some additional information, and you just combine it. And, and uh, draw some conclusions on the combination. And this is something that, uh, well, which uh, can't say that the art can't do. So, and this combination of logical reasoning and machine learning, that's basically the goal of neuro symbolic AI. So, I'd say stay tuned for the next couple of years until some advances are made and this will be possible to do somehow automatically. But not yet. Uh, and then I've felt, uh, I mean, the current, current hype is a bit about chat GPT. So, anyone who didn't hear about it yet? <laughs> Good, so everyone, basically. And I felt a bit challenged because people told me, oh, ChatGPT is so intelligent, it knows everything. I just um, <clears throat> talk to it and it gives me an answer. Who needs data management? And I felt a bit challenged, negatively. Um, so I started just looking into uh, ChatGPT a little, and as you all probably also have found, it does some hallucinations. Oh, it's a nice way of saying it's wrong sometimes. <laughs> And uh, it makes up these nice cases. So one particular I like is where I found a law professor and made up a sexual harassment case. Problem is the law professor is real, the sexual harassment not. So it's, it's, I, I mean, my interpretation is that it's likely for such a professor to be involved in such a sexual harassment case. It just picked the wrong example. This one maybe as an exception is not. And so there's an interesting law case going on because that guy, as a lawyer, actually sued the company. Let's see how it ends up. But we will then know if we can sue um, ChatGPT for wrong information. But still, so it makes mistakes. So I felt like let's have a chat. 
with ChatGPT. So what I asked it is, you as a large language model, if you need to be certain about an answer, uh, what do you prefer? Do you want rather pick the large graph, or do you rather trust a, a trained model as the source of your information? So, and guess what it said? So it said it would use the knowledge graph, yes. Um, so, and exactly for the reasons I'm, I'm trying to, to advertise, because in knowledge graphs, you have facts that you can trust. You can look them up. You can use uh, logical reasoning to, to check if it's true or not. And the um, machine learning model is just a black box that you have to decide to trust or not to trust. And what also brought up here is the update problem. So in large graph, you just add a few or change, update a few edges, and you're done. Update complete. The machine learning model is a bit more difficult. In the worst case, you just train it over from scratch. Uh, with these large language models, that's uh, very, very expensive, so you wouldn't do it unless you really have to. So I'm happy that ChatGPT agrees with me. Uh, so data management. It's nice, but you should have. Huh? It's saying light. It's saying light, but it just, this time I, I chose to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you can choose not to. <laughs> but I'm still going to say the same thing if, if, if this thing agrees or not. <laughs> so in this case, I'm just happy it did agree with me. <laughs> um, so and this is my usual disclaimer. It's like uh, right now, everybody's kind of uh, singing in the big flood of data. So, and, and they're kind of starting to drown because it's so much information that people can really make sense of. And then uh, what they call out for, for help uh, to rescue them is machine learning. And um, you might guess what I'm about to say. Uh, I'm going to show you some, some, some pictures. So, I mean, what's happening, one thing that's happening, that's the one on the left, is um, you just uh, train a model and if it doesn't show what you want, it doesn't do what you want correctly. You just shake the data a little, use a different training set, train it again, and ta-da, it works. Um, which is one approach, but it's not really generalizable. And on the other side is, if you're German, that uh, uh, makes more sense, but let me translate it. So when Texas says, the next time we train our AI uh, on, on data, or we feed data to our AI, we should maybe uh, pay more attention to data quality because the AI kind of went crazy. So it's kind of uh, my call for arms. So don't give up on data management and data engineering just yet. Um, machine learning can't survive or can't do without high quality data. And this is garbage in, garbage out principle. So if you put garbage in and you train the machine learning model on faulty data or erroneous data, you can't really expect it to output the right thing, because it's only seeing the wrong answers, how could it ever get to the right answer uh, if it has, seen, uh, has been trained on wrong answers? So data quality is, is important no matter what. Um, and that leads me to the title of the talk, so no intelligence without knowledge. So if we can't get the knowledge and data quality right, we can't really expect machine learning to be intelligent. Okay, then we could start with philosophy and start with uh, Plato and Socrates who also thought about what is knowledge actually. So knowledge is justified true belief um, and I don't really can't define what justified and true belief really means and they have spent a long time and very long documents about trying to define it so let's skip it. And Socrates, uh, true knowledge exists in knowing that you know nothing. Well, I agree with that, but for computer scientists, it doesn't really help either. So let's uh, go beyond the law philosophers and uh, stick to, to what we as computer scientists rather know. So usually we started with data, just some random bits and pieces of, of information or, um, that we can't really interpret. Then we start classifying it, so we give it types. So it kind of starts making sense as information. Then we arrive at knowledge, where we see the connections between these different bits and pieces and see how they go together. 
And then uh, we can move on to inside. We know that this part and that part is connected somehow. If we change this, this one also changes. And you could call it wisdom or something else uh, where you can actually explain that how they are connected and you can really understand how to tune one and what effect it has on the other. What we shouldn't do uh, ever is this. So, I mean, you know this the saying that you shouldn't trust any statistic if you haven't to forge yourself? This is another way of expressing it. So in the end, uh, there's always a danger that you see what you want to see. So you should always strive, uh, strive at being um, objective and factual. So let's try to be that. And my way of being that is using knowledge graphs, of course. <laughs> so, um, in theory, knowledge uh, can be captured in many different ways. And um, philosophers might agree or disagree of what knowledge is, but for practical reasons, I'm just talking about knowledge graphs as, as my way of um, representing knowledge. And uh, there's also different uh, ways of how to define a knowledge graph, and I just go with the simplest one. It's a collection of connected and related facts. And trust me, in literature there's lots of different definitions, but that's the most simple one, which is yeah, fine enough for, for this talk. Okay. What are the challenges? So this is kind of, the first one is you need to extract uh, an integrated knowledge somehow. The one example is the uh, semantic data lakes or data fabrics that I've shown. So you use the knowledge graph to integrate different types of information into a virtual representation of this graph. But I mean, I mentioned it already. And um, let's just keep that part short. And next part is a lot of graph data management. So there's, uh, I don't know how, which time we have 40, 50 years of data uh, basis research in relational data. Graph data management is not that far yet, but there's, and there's still lots of things, things uh, to do about it. Um, so one is how do I organize the data? So there's not just one single way to store a graph. If you want to do it, uh, you have a relational table with three columns. Um, the first and last one is, is the node ID. The middle one is the label of the, uh, of the edge. Done. Works. It's just not that if we have a relation and for each edge that you need to connect, you need to do a sales join. So it's not going to be efficient uh, for larger queries. You can also store it in different ways of having uh, the first node and then um, having to that connected all the edges that uh, start with that node. You can use a B plus tree, you can use some other kinds of table structures. So there's lots of different ways um, on how to represent data. And uh, what the best one is always depends on the application. So on the queries you need to run. So lots of different things to do on that side. So, um, and that's like query processing and, and optimization. So once you have the data stored, and I didn't even mention it, you can store the data in, in very different ways, uh, in different machines. You can have one machine, you can have parallel cluster architectures where you split the data and distribute it on, on the cluster. You can have these linked uh, data view on things where the data counts on different sources natively. So lots of different things you can do. And then, of course, the criminalization you do uh, depends on how the data is stored. And this is just one representation of it. So we usually have, we talk about RDF graphs, you have a special query language. And then you get these queries and they try to find out which sources, uh, which knowledge graphs are actually relevant. You try to query them, you try to split the query up to the subparts, execute them on different graphs and get the data back. So lots of different things to do there. And apart from that, you should, uh, one uh, thing is keeping the data um, available and, and keeping it up to date because a lot changes. And yeah, making old versions queryable is a special challenge. And then, of course, there's the whole problem of, of uh, provenance. So who had a chance to mess around with the data? So where does it come from? How was it processed? And also for queries, there's, um, how and why provenance. So for each answer that you get, um, you can 
obtain information on which part of which graph actually contributed to the answer. So it's also very important to, at least for me, to gain some trust in the answers I get. So lots of different things to do there as well. This is interesting. Uh, and then we have uh, frameworks and platforms. I think I'm about to crash on that one. Um, so you can also build whole ecosystems around it. Um, so really, like, uh, if you have Spark MapReduce that's trained on, on tabular, or that's designed for tabular data, not for graphs, you can set up the same thing for graphs as well. So you have a natively the whole ecosystem to uh, support graph data, to make, um, well, the whole part from extraction to uh, um, having data in a real system. You can also do all that on the graphs. So group by queries are also possible, just not the usually advertised um, data format. And then in the end, you have uh, usually also some machine learning um, applications to run on. And uh, you can also do uh, some uh, help uh, standard machine learning approaches. So if you have uh, systems or different labs that use different pipelines to analyze the data, so they have input data, they have a machine learning pipelines with a script, and you have some out, uh, output data and results. So what uh, usually happens is that, well, even if somebody has a Git uh, link to some repository, it's still difficult to make sense out of it. And uh, there is no way really to find uh, a similar pipeline, a pipeline to what it, uh, you are trying to do. So what happens is that you can represent semantically what the code actually means. So instead of in trying to index the code, you go one step higher and try to represent the semantics of, of the operation. And then represent it as a knowledge graph. Then you can share the knowledge graph between different gaps and say, this pipeline does this. And this pipeline does that, and then you can just compare, even though the code might be different language, different system, whatever, you can find similar pipelines. So it's a bit of an exotic application of knowledge graph, but still it is one to use knowledge graphs as the semantic representation of, of code and data. And then it goes into this AutoML uh, idea where you can actually sit there and say, I want to do this, and the system tells you, yeah, these guys over there tried something similar. I recommend you have a look at their code and maybe you can use the same thing. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of data quality issues uh, in knowledge graphs. Um, and uh, that's about, uh, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. So you can actually mine constraints on the data. So instead of just accepting this as a knowledge graph, you can also uh, define some constraints, uh, like some intermediate schema that the knowledge graph should fulfill. And in doing so, you can um, ensure some data quality. So you can prevent certain uh, different types of uh, erroneous or spurious information to occur in the first place. I will come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, what else do we have? Uh, applications, I assume, with the laptop and the guest. Um, so then in the end, you have also data science and, and interdisciplinarity. And many of you <coughs> might have noticed that um, a lot of interesting uh, problems uh, occur when you talk to people that are non-computer scientists. That's the fun part of it. So they actually, they, they produce the data and they have interesting data sets to, to play around with. And they have their own problems. And there is, uh, um, here's an example from um, sustainability assessment. So it's, um, so whenever you build uh, uh, you're trying to construct a, a large uh, building or you have a project. What at least some countries or many countries require is a sustainability assessment report. This is a large textual document that starts with, um, okay, you want to build, let's say, this building in the forest, and the consequence is you have to cut some trees. So the CO2 footprint uh, well, is affected. And then they suggest some mitigation measures, so you have to plant some trees elsewhere. 
And it, there's a lot of NLP involved to get information out of these documents. And then you can start building tools to, to help these people. First problem is to find similar reports, which is not as easy as it, uh, as it sounds because there's no format or nothing you can rely on uh, that is similar from one report to the next. So it's just a bunch of text and some tables that always look different, uh, different names for things and different languages even, so it's very diverse. And then in the end, you can try to, to build something like this where you actually have a tool that says, oh yeah, you have your CO2 footprint uh, because, uh, as a factor because you cut some trees. Mitigation measure in uh, case one, two, three is we plant some trees or I don't know what it is. Um, so these kind of things can, can help um, people in, real, uh, with, in other domains um, solve their problems. Uh, another big area is, is uh, medical data. So, I mean, and they have huge data sets. It's, the fun part is that, or the annoying part is that it's difficult to get access to it. But it also makes sense because uh, nobody wants their uh, patient data to be publicly available. So. But if, if you have access to it, you can do a lot of different analysis. And this is just an, a simple example that if you know which drugs the patient takes, and if you base it about the patient, you can use that information to kind of uh, predict what uh, diseases or mobilities the patient has. So in case the patient is uh, showed up and the only thing you can do is uh, check what medication the patient takes uh, and then uh, you can say uh, there are certain cases where I think it's a stroke that some certain medication patients get and then if that happens you should under no circumstances be able to treat the patients with something else. So there are certain combinations that are deadly, and then it's important to know uh, what preconditions the patient has. Um, but I mean, in general case, uh, health data is, is gigantically big, and you can always uh, kind of plug in external knowledge to help um, we'll get better results. So, for instance, it's easier to predict in this case if it's diabetes or not than if uh, to predict if it's diabetes type uh, one or two. So, if, uh, and then if you just try to predict one level higher, you get information about the hierarchy from somewhere else and predict um, well, false granularity. All the training data doesn't have it. <coughs> and uh, in another case I put here is bioscience. This is, uh, this is from DNA sequencing, but just take it as an example for, for the whole bioscience area. So there's um, lots of interesting data about <coughs> genes and um, proteins and habitats and these things go together. So if you manage to integrate uh, different types of data sets, so, um, so in this project we're trying to predict in the end uh, the, uh, for bioscience people based on data we've seen, uh, go to these coordinates, take a sample there, and you might find interesting new species you've never seen before. That's possible if you have the samples from other places, so you know what they found, then you can plug in information about the environment, so you know the characteristics of the environment, and then to uh, make new findings, you can predict or find uh, environments that have the same conditions and make predictions of what to find there. But you also have to integrate different types of data. Okay, so uh, from all these, these nice challenges, I, I just pick one of them. Um, and that's how to increase the quality of data or knowledge graphs. The basic thing to remember is that. Uh, knowledge graphs are also not 100% correct. So, even if you do uh, your best effort in trying to make uh, the best knowledge graph ever, it's always uh, possible to have some mistakes. Uh, it's possible to get a long way to, to make it accurate, but uh, since also knowledge changes over time, you never know. Um, so, the basic question is is marijuana legal? 
there's just not just one answer, and if the law changes, it might be legal, uh, illegal one day and legal the next day. So there's always uh, to keep in mind that knowledge graphs are also not 100% correct. And they're definitely not completely either, so that's the open world assumption. So there's always knowledge we can't capture, so it's impossible to know everything. Um, and I think that's going back to the old philosophers. So in that sense, uh, they were right. So it is about knowing that we don't know everything. But we can still get a long way. So one of the things I would like to introduce you to is um, Shackle. So who has heard about that standard yet? Probably not too many. So it's something uh, that goes in line with knowledge graphs in, in RDF. Uh, so RDF is a model for representing knowledge graphs, and Shackle is a way to present constraints on it. And that's kind of a, it's a, a lightweight schema. But I haven't even talked about schemas in knowledge graphs. There's something like that, and you can do it with uh, ontologies, for instance, or you can um, do these lightweight um, constraints as called shackle shapes. And it's better to have these, these uh, shape graphs that is basically a graph pattern. So you take uh, some class of nodes and define constraints that they should fulfill. Like uh, an instance of type first, you should have a name. That would be a very simple constraint you can define. And then you have the data graph. That's the big knowledge graph that represents all the, the, the knowledge that we have at this moment. And in the end, you see we have this, this nice knowledge graph. It's a data graph here. And then you define a constraint on a subset of those nodes. <laughs> So for instance, all instances of type person. That's a small subset here. You can filter them out further, and then you define the constraints on it. You can validate the knowledge graph against the constraints and get a list of violations. And then you can decide to fix the data or leave it as it is. Um, so this is an example. So on the right, there's a knowledge graph in a, a different representation than I've introduced before. So there's the part here, I'm sure, so maybe this works. So here is the uh, instances of type person, there's ID, it's John Doe, it's a type person, and it has a name, John, and it has another name, John, and the age is 18. And then you have this uh, shape graph here. So it's a uh, for instances of class person, so that fits. And this person should have properties. So the person should have a name, min count one, max count one, so exactly one name. And the person should have an age, min count one, so one age. And uh, it should minimum be uh, 18, so including 18, it should at least have the value 18. So this is apparently a sign for checking uh, that you have the age 18 for probably some, some law requires that as a entry point. So and if you run this validation, uh, this, uh, this constraints on, on the graph, you get that there's a violation. Because I said that the name can only occur once, min one, uh, minimum once, uh, maximum once, but this person has two. So in this case, the validation would fail and say that this graph doesn't conform, it doesn't support these constraints because of that node. So that's the basic idea behind uh, these shapes and the knowledge graph. And then uh, you might wonder, so who uses uh, constraints? Um, so uh, there's a survey. And uh, what happens right now is that uh, applications in, in companies and let's say in, in real life uh, are of course interested in maintaining a certain standard and quality of the graph. And in order to use it in the commercial applications, you need to make sure that certain um, constraints are fulfilled. And this is a tool to ensure that this is the case. So the problem is that most uh, formulate them manually because there's no real tools that are efficient in, in mining them yet. Uh, I will show you an approach it does. Um, and uh, in the end, um, what you have, even if you normally have a, an automatic tool, it just tries to, uh, it will show you everything. 
So I will show you uh, a shape with constraints that occur a single time in a million um, similar types of nodes. And that probably that's, that's a constraint you don't want to enforce, but it's difficult to see and, and judge that automatically. So what you can do is um, this pipeline here. So you start with data, general types of data, and you try to extract uh, a knowledge graph. So you get a lot of different data sets. They're overlapping. They might be erroneous. It might be difficult to integrate it. Uh, but at this point, when you manage to integrate the data, and then you can use it for question answering or any kind of analytics or applications afterwards. But it's, it's a step in the middle that we're interested in at the moment. So, what you can do based on knowledge graph is to define some shapes. And uh, the standard from uh, uh, is this Shaka. Um, there's also other formats, and I'll put them here. So, Shack is another way to formulate constraints, but and let's say it's just there are some, some differences, but more or less most of syntactic with some specialties. But let's stay with uh, shackle shapes. And then you can define this, uh, these shapes and apply them on the data. So the questions are um, how can we do this efficiently? So if we have a billion triples, how do we automatically um, extract and mine these constraints um, and, uh, and find them? How do, uh, do we make sure that what we mine is not spur spurious? Uh, so that just means we are not interested in those uh, shapes that are only a single time uh, among a thousand similar nodes. So we probably don't want to enforce them. And the third question is uh, how can we use those shapes to to fix the data, to make to increase the quality, and uh, find errors. And uh, so this is a, an example from university life that is probably familiar to all of you. So we have a department that's uh, and in the uh, computer science faculty, and the faculty is part of the university. We have um, Alice here, who is a chair and works for a computer science faculty. And she teaches a database course. She's also a full professor. And then we have a student, um, his name is Bob, and he takes a database course. OK, so fairly basic computer science example from everyday life. And then we're interested in, in both now. So if we just look at the node Bob, what kind of shapes can we find? So what kind of constraints apply to Bob? <laughs> so uh, what we'll do is, in an naive way, we will go through each uh, to each entity, extract its class, and see and try to define the shape for it. So Bob would fall into the, stu uh, uh, the student class, and we would define a shape for students based on Bob. Then we'll pass the properties. So he has an advisor, he has a name, and he takes a course. Um, and then we would kind of collect this information in, uh, and create this shape. What we have here is then, um, so this is for all students, um, so all nodes that have the type student. And the first property is um, a name. It has literal, so a string value. And then we uh, define that it occurs exactly once. I refine. Then we do the same for uh, takes course. So the target uh, so is, is an instance of uh, class course. In this case, it's a database course. And let's say that students should at least take one course. Then the third one is that the student also has an advisor who is a full professor. And that should also occur once. So we could extract that for, for all students, or at least this is what we would find for Bob. Then, oh, the red is a bad color here. Um, so we could assume that there's also another edge piece of information that says Bob uh, um, uh, is connected to Harley Street and the label is Street. So he probably lives in Harley Street. So if this occurs once, do we really want to create uh, or extend this uh, constraint with Street? We all agree that 
straight to Justin, can we connect it to Bob, or should we write a one to model an address, a proper one? And that, that way it gets uh, difficult, because if this occurs only once, it probably was a mistake. Then, and it should have been a proper address that should, should have been registered, instead of just a street that randomly pops up. You don't even know the city. So, and this is, and finding such uh, <coughs> combinations that occur rarely is uh, uh, what we are up for. And this would be called a spurious chain, because we don't really want it. But we can find it. So what we can do in this approach is, um, we probably all know uh, data mining. So the, the notion of confidence and support will probably be familiar. So this is what we're going to use here. So we plug in this approach that has some, uh, that also has an approximate feature where it's, it does some sampling, not to go through the entire graph, but just through parts of it to build uh, the um, um, these shapes. So um, frequent pattern mining. Um, so it has the notion of support. So how many times does something occur? So for instance, how many nodes of uh, type person or type student actually occur in the entire data set? That would be the support. And then I have a constraint uh, um, that I can have confi compute confidence for. So for how what's the percentage of students that actually have a street or that have a name, and that would be the confidence. So based on, on all the matching entities, uh, for how many of them or which percentage uh, is this condition true, that's the confidence. And by using these two values, we can actually get a long way in uh, eliminating shapes that actually occur only once or are tied to only one uh, instance, and if you actually don't want to enforce. So, Based on DBpedia, so that's one of the big data sets I've shown in the beginning. So it's um, the one that was extracted from Wikidata. If you run this on it, uh, you get up to 12,000 something shapes that's containing everything. And if you just use a supporting confidence of at least a support of 10, so uh, it should apply to at least 10 nodes, and the constraints should be fulfilled by at least a quarter of them. Then we will display uh, the shape to the user. Then you get down to 4,000. Still a lot, but uh, it's at least a third of what we had before. And that is, and if you play with these numbers, you can narrow it down even further. Standard uh, pattern mining uh, uh, optimization problem. So you have to tune the parameters to the application. But this is doable, and you filter out all these constraints that just occur once. And what can we do in the end? So this is an example. So we have uh, musical shapes, uh, musical artists, and they are in 52,000 of them in, in, in Wikipedia. And uh, a few of them, 11, have uh, a postal code for some reason. Um, and if you uh, actually, so if you can compute the confidence, then 11 <coughs> out of 52,000 Zero point whatever, so it, uh, it goes down to a confidence of zero. So we're actually not really certain that this makes sense. And then uh, you can kind of try to inspect those those occurrences. And what you find is uh, an example here that some um, um, artists actually, for some reason, for this artist here, Amia Rodriguez, is actually not just a musical artist, but also a settlement. And don't ask me how this happened. Uh, we need to ask the guys who um, created the Wikipedia. But this seems wrong. And if you just look up uh, these cases that violate the constraint, or just have these weird shapes, you can actually look there. And you can also have a look, a look at the Wikipedia page. So it's indeed a person. And then you can create so I'm curious that automatically delete the triples or information that shouldn't be there. You can use these shapes to, to fix the data in this way. Okay, so let me sum up. Um, so knowledge graphs have lots of different applications. So the standard ones are uh, search engines where they look up the knowledge of infoboxes and knowledge graphs. 
Then I've mentioned these large uh, open uh, open knowledge graphs <coughs> that are mined from different sources. Um, the linked open data in the cloud, of course, is one another application. The uh, by keeping our our data uh, safe from the large companies, basically, that's yet another application. Um, here is embodied AI. It's also very interesting application based on knowledge. Then uh, I also have my dear friend ChatGPT that can still benefit from knowledge and looking at and running the answers against the knowledge graph for automation at least. And uh, so the key takeaways I would like to highlight are knowledge graphs are everywhere. Hope I convinced you a bit about that. If not, I will turn it over. Um, so knowledge graphs are a powerful tool to organize uh, knowledge. Quality plays an important role because trusting something that is very erroneous and faulty doesn't really well, increase my trust in it. And, uh, um, and uh, machine learning benefits from accurate knowledge. So first, in the way that you can actually train the machine learning on, on the knowledge. That's the garbage in, garbage out paradigm. But also the other way around. Like, if you, you can use, you use a lot of uh, machine learning to help knowledge graphs. So, first the NLP to extract it, but also in the end you can uh, use the combination to kind of make the best out of both worlds. And there's plenty of open challenges for, for improvement. Uh, some are more on the machine learning side, others are more on the data engineering side. And, uh, well, my final words are going to be uh, no intelligence without knowledge. And uh, since I couldn't help it, I'll also put it there. So mind, uh, mind the quality of the data when you uh, train uh, a machine learning model on the data. If it's uh, notch graphs or standard data, the quality matters quite a lot. And with that, thanks a lot for your attention. And you have to <laughs>
joins with terrible aggregations with uh, dozens of filtering, but on the other hand, probably they are larger. So, it, it, are there some works in, in this area on uh, updating, making, making uh, up to date these knowledge graphs? Yes, I mean, there, there's different places. One goes under archiving simply, where you just have one knowledge graph, store another one, store another one that's probably closest to material use. Um, and then there is another one that's a temporal knowledge graph that's trying to attach some uh, temporal validity to the, to the edges of things. So there's different approaches on uh, 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 solving the problem. And that's, a, that's another full talk. Yeah. And for another question, <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, with the um, uh, reference to the schema, I was wondering whether it could be possible to assess kind of the quality of the graph or look for uh, patterns. Yesterday we were talking about fairness. And so the idea was to have a look at the data set and determine whether there were fairness metrics that uh, were um, code. So I was wondering whether with, uh, would it make sense with these uh, schema patterns try to understand some properties of the knowledge graph. Uh, that, that's an interesting question. So now I, need, I would need to know more about uh, fairness measures than, than I do. Uh, but I think, I mean, it's, it's it's a different kind of, of information you can extract from the graph. And in a sense, uh, I think it, it could be possible uh, to use. Uh, so if you can express the, the uh, fairness measures in, in the shape, very easy. But you can also use some, some uh, or compute the measures on the fly. And if it's on the raw graph or some portion of it that is pre-selected, that uh, needs to be decided on what needs to be computed. Yes, exactly like uh, uh, having extracting a sample of the graph with specific properties thanks to the, the schema that could be analyzed or produced. Uh. Yes, I mean, I mean, that's even possible also without uh, shape constraints. So that might be solvable without um, going through, through the shapes. But maybe we should have a chat afterwards. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, what I didn't mention is that uh, you can also try in this provenance, you can try to attach metadata to the different edges and part of the graph. That's yet a different story to, to take care of. Thank you. Robert, you have another question? No, let me start I asked you one. Thank you, Katya. Um, so my question is, so there are a wide variety of applications with knowledge graphs, uh, but my perception is that still the way of interacting with knowledge graphs is still rather technical and related to computer scientists, SparkQL or Shackle. So I don't know if there is any, any research or anything going on to make the way to interact with them simpler for yeah. all kinds of uh, users. I mean, you just got my, my personal view on things, so I'm more like the technical person, and I'm, I don't want to have this fancy interface. I'm uh, happy with the sparkle. Uh, but uh, there's this, uh, this whole bunch of uh, uh, question answering tools where you actually try to have a natural language interface where you actually talk to, uh, to the interface and, and type in a natural language query, and that will kind of also try to give you uh, some explanation back. So that's, Taps them onto national and natural language processing, and that's. As I usually say, it's it's, it's uh, uh, in another field that I'm not in, but when you write out those applications, will make it easier for people to 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 use the data. Okay, so we are perfect on time, and since you will be around, uh, you can just ask uh, Katia more questions if you have, if you want, uh, during the coffee break, lunches, or whatever, right? So let's just stop here. Thank you, again, Katia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.